every day I wake up. Welcome back to the um, to the last session this morning before we break for the noontime lunch uh, roundtables for those of you who signed up for it. Um, it is my pleasure and and uh, honor to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Gary Foster has been a colleague and a friend for quite some time. And it's going to talk about uh, topics again, I think, that will resonate uh, with all of you, which has to do with expectations of weight loss and what's realistic, what's not realistic, and coping as it relates to that. Uh, Gary just took a new job uh, as Chief Scientific Officer for Weight Watchers International. Um, he's a psychologist, a professor of medicine, public health and psychology, and founder and director emeritus now of the Center for Obesity Research and Education at Temple University. Uh, Dr. Foster's research interests include the prevention and treatment of obesity. He studies a variety of treatment approaches, including behavior therapy, pharmacotherapy, and surgery. He evaluates obesity prevention strategies in schools and communities. Some of his current research includes the effects of weight loss on sleep apnea, the role of school breakfast in preventing childhood obesity, and the effects of changing the environment in corner stores and supermarkets in low-income areas. He's authored or co-authored more than 160 scientific publications and three books on obesity. Gary is past president of the Obesity Society and currently serves on the Nutrition Committee of the American Heart Association. And also, I think, a, as a tribute in, uh, of, of Gary um, and rec recognition of his leadership, he's been appointed a member of the 2015 Dietary Guidelines for Americans Advisory Committee, which occurs every five years. Gary, it's an honor to have you speak in front of us. Thank you, Bob. Let me start by just saying it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and I say that a lot, actually, when I give a talk. Um, but this one's a little different. I was thinking on the way over here that I've spent 30 years in the field of obesity treatment and research and prevention, really with folks like you in mind, and sort of what it's like on the, the front lines to actually struggle with weight, to manage weight, to have ups and downs. And um, I don't think I've ever had the opportunity, and I thank Bob for the opportunity, to actually address people who are right in the thick of it. And it's a nice crystallization for me of why I began in this field quite accidentally 30 years ago with the likes of Mickey Stunkard and Kelly Brownell, Tom Wadden and others um, who have all really informed my thinking. Have I left the uh, pointer down there? <laughs> That's what I was shoveling through my pockets for. <laughs> so as Bob suggested, what I'm going to do today is to cover four things. Um, <clears throat> one is just to summarize for you what expectations are around weight loss, and then give you maybe a sobering view of what uh, the outcomes are. Sobering and depending on your perspective, but definitely quite a contrast from what folks expect when they start the weight loss journey. And then <clears throat> give you a little bit of data. I'm not gonna do lots of p-values or graphs. There's some, but not many. But just to give you a sense of what are the, the, the data saying about the benefits of weight loss. But I really want to end with what I think is the most important thing is how do you, <clears throat> for those who struggle with their weight, I, and I've been seeing uh, patients in individual and group sessions probably for 25 years of my career, um, and I don't think I've ever encountered somebody who doesn't struggle with the idea that I want to lose 10 more or 5 more or 30 more or 40 more, independent of how much weight they've already successfully lost. This could be people have lost 100 or people have lost 10. And it seems to be a really universal phenomenon, and I'd like to address that at the end. So let's just start with expectations. This was a, a question, my colleagues and I, it seems like a very simple question, right? But the field back in the 90s was very clear. George Blackburn and others had suggested that, look, a 5 to 10% weight loss is really uh, quite successful medically. So we had this unconventional idea, is why don't we ask people who are in the process what they think? about these outcomes. And without leading the witness by saying, what's a five or 10% weight loss mean to you? We just asked them this simple question, what's your goal weight? And it was a, a couple of groups of people. The first group was this relatively small group, mainly females. 
The second group, a much bigger group, included uh, males and also included folks who were undergoing bariatric surgery. So they were slightly heavier. Um, they were about 220 pounds in the first study and about 250 pounds in the second study. And what they told us at the time shocked us. They said they wanted to reduce their body weight by one third. And again, we gave them no leads. We asked them exactly that question, what's your goal weight? And this was before they were about to lose weight. So that was about three times more than what was then recommended and what now is recommended from National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute guidelines and many other guidelines. And these were largely, but not all, people presenting for treatment for non-surgical treatments, and they were actually expecting surgical-like outcomes. So then we took it a step further. We said, please read these weights, and we'd like you to put a, a number in pounds after them. So the first was a dream weight. So you're be, you're before you're about to embark on this uh, year-long weight loss program, I was at the University of Penn at the time, and so what do you want to weigh at the end of this program? Dream weight, sort of a snap of your finger. If you could weigh whatever you, could, whatever you wanted, what would that weight be? So, okay, that would be whatever number in pounds. Happy weight, not as ideal as the first one, but it's one that you'd be happy to achieve. Acceptable weight, a weight that's not, you're not going to be happy with this, but I could accept it since it's less than I weigh now. Or a disappointed weight, we worded this as negatively as we could. A weight that's less than your current weight, but one that you could not view as successful in any way you would be disappointed if this were your weight after the program. Well, that weight was a 17% weight loss. Changed a little over time, but not much. And there's been about a dozen studies since showing exactly, not exactly, but within a couple percent, the same numbers. This is, look, I could hack it, it's okay, but I'm not happy. That's 25% weight loss. That's what some surgical procedures produce. Happy was 30% and a dreamy outcome would be a 38% reduction in body weight. So more bad news. So we looked at what people said before treatment. We looked at what happened after treatment. And they had lost 16 kilos is about 35 pounds, 36 pounds. So that's a pretty good weight loss for non-surgical treatments in a 48-week period. And at the end of that time, we went back and compared their actual weights to the weights that they had said were happy, acceptable, et cetera. So the bottom line in this graph, from my point of view, is that almost half of people had not yet even reached the weight they thought was disappointing. It's been great working with you for 48 weeks, but I'm not even disappointed yet. <laughs> if I lose another 5, 10 pounds, then I'll be disappointed. <laughs> but you, Mr. Smart Professional, are telling me, five to 10% is successful. So in short, there's a big discrepancy between what professional societies, based on good data, by the way, this isn't just made up, there's good rationale that a little bit of weight loss goes a long way, but clearly not in sync with the people who are doing the work. And I think this is the, the outcome, and I think professionals are standing by, I think, appropriately, or not appropriately, but accurately in this picture is sort of you know, out of the picture and, and what can they do about it, where the people who are struggling are quite frustrated. So one of the ways to think about this is what, what's the mythology that surrounds goal weight? Well, a one that's probably perpetuated by the use of BMI or if you're old enough to remember metropolitan life uh, height and weight tables, it's that's what I should be based on my height. Well, you know, I guess for risk, and I'm a scientist, and I can appreciate and I value all the graphs and stuff that we show, and I'm not saying that BMI is a bad measure of risk, but doesn't it seem sort of simple-minded that of all the things that affect body weight, we're going to say everybody who's the same height should be the same weight? Doesn't that really ignore genetics, metabolism, literally how people come in? to a program or how they literally come to the table. Yeah, we use height because it's easy to measure and we can do a weight for height and you know it's easy. So I'm not knocking the methodology. What I am saying is from a personal point of view, it seems at least narrow to say that the only factor I'm going to consider when deciding what my weight should be is my height. 
again, I've had many conversations with patients over the years. Where they say, but my BMI is whatever, 28. It's got to be a 25. Or my BMI is a 33, and it's got to get below 30. And again, I think it assumes that everything's the same for everybody. It's not based on height. Another myth mythological belief is I can reach my weight because I've been there before. Question we often uh, get people to consider is, well, what was your life like then? So it was when I whatever, when I got married, when I was in high school, when I got my first job, when I was whatever. Well, what was your life like then? What was your eating and activity like? But more broadly, what was your overall lifestyle like? Do you have as much time as you did then to focus on what needs to be focused on to lose weight and keep it off? In other words, life changes. And that's not an apology or a cop-out. It's a realistic assessment to say, is it reasonable that my weight should be the same if I'm 45 as it was when I'm 20? What else is the same in your life at 45 that it was 20? Again, it's just sort of, to my way of thinking, a very narrow, um, focused, perhaps, way of zeroing in on weight and ignoring a lot of other factors. Another big a false belief is I won't get all the benefits in weight loss until I reach my goal weight, as if there is some effect, right? So I have some bad stuff here. What we we'll call it appearance stuff, health stuff, psychological stuff, whatever it is, and that's bad when I weigh a lot. And it might get a little bit better as I lose weight, but it doesn't really get resolved or cured until I get to some magic number. The data, frankly, just don't support that. And the final one, which is perhaps maybe more fundamental, is that my actual weight makes a difference. So it actually makes a difference if I'm 222 or 200. And I would argue that number is relatively meaningless as a number, it's what the consequences of that weight does. And that's going to be a lot different if 222 is your lifetime highest weight or if 322 is your lifetime highest weight. But the idea, and I sort of get it, it's sort of like putting, putting in your ATM card to an ATM machine and it comes out with a number. It seems quite real, right, because it's a number and we can focus in on it. It doesn't take into account what things are going in, what things are going out, have things cleared, all that kind of stuff. But because weight happens to be a number, I think we get overly preoccupied with it. So just some things to think about in terms of I need to get to my goal weight. So what are the outcomes? I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because I think largely it's known. I just want to give you a sort of a brief run through of what the consequences are of a little bit of weight loss. I'll talk later today when I'm talking a little bit about stress and emotional eating, about the components of behavioral treatment. Right now, I just want you to focus in on that. Remember, disappointing is 17% and dreamy is 38% from folks in the trenches who are actually doing this. The best programs and the best academic, best academic medical centers in the country gets about between an eight and a 10% weight loss with behavioral treatment. You can make that a little bit better by some methods using portion control. I apologize for these graphs. That the numbers are correct, the graphs are not. I was trying to change these from kilograms to pounds. So you get more weight loss at both three months and 12 months if you use meal replacements. And what they are doesn't make much difference if it's a shake, a bar, an entree. The idea is that that's structured help. And I think largely it's about simplicity, that sometimes we make this so difficult, right? So it says it's simple. I have a shake for breakfast, a shake for lunch, and a rodent of my choice for dinner. The point here is that we sometimes get so bogged down in all the minutia about the macronutrients, fat, carbohydrate, protein, calcium, fiber. It gets quite mind-boggling, right? So you've all been through this. So a doc or a dietitian may say something to you like, well, you know, self-monitoring is really important, so I want you to track. You say, what do I track? They say calories. Okay, how many calories? So I'm making up a number just for speed here, 1,500 calories. Okay, 1,500 calories. Anything else I have to track? Yes. What? Well, um, fat, because fat's really important. Okay, so how do I do that? So about 30% of your calories should come from fat. 
Well, you know, once you say that, just a lack of interest, people have bad experiences in math class, whatever, you've, you've lost a certain amount of the population, right? So 1,500 times 30%, that's 450 calories. Okay, anything else? Yeah, but fat calories aren't so easy to access on the label, they come in grams. So now you have to divide that 450 by nine. You can see where this is going, right? And then of that 30%, 10% have to be mono fats, 10% have to be poly, fiber, soluble fiber, insoluble fiber, don't forget sodium. My God, like what we ask people to do to choose what they're gonna have for lunch. So simplicity counts. Just briefly again, uh, Dr. Still is gonna go over, uh, I think today at lunch, at uh, different tools in the toolbox. So I'm not gonna blabber all the points except to say there are medications out there and the weight losses range from about six to 11%. Remember, 17% is disappointing. Bariatric surgery, many of you uh, have been through this experience and I think you know these facts. There are different kinds of procedures, uh, whether they're restrictive or malabsorptive. Um, the point I want to leave with you is that their weight losses are between about 20 and 30 percent. So we're getting closer to what people attribute disappointing, but again, most of those people were presenting not for surgical treatment. It turns out the surgical treatment folks, there's not a lot of data on expectations and folks undergoing surgery have even higher expectations. The discrepancy is a little bit smaller, but what happens is if people are going through surgery, they say, well, you know, 30 percent wouldn't be enough, right? like everybody else says, people not going through surgery, which makes sense. There's a more intensive treatment. I want a more impressive outcome. Here are some data from a paper showing remarkably uh, the, the, the incredible maintenance of weight loss uh, over time. There's some relapse for sure, but these are data from Lars Sjöström in the Swedish obesity study um, showing that these weight losses just aren't short term. All right, so what are the benefits? I think many of you have seen these kind of slides before, and that with excess weight comes consequences on many organ systems in the body. So you can pick whatever part of the body. Some of you have probably experienced things like diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and many other things. So that's the bad news. The good news, a little bit more bad news first before we get to the good news, um, is that if you look at really important drivers of morbidity and mortality of people getting sick or the risk of dying, um, you can see that as you go from a BMI of 25 to 30, it goes up a little bit, and from 30 to 40, it goes up a lot. The good news here, which I think is often overlooked, is that if you, people get really bogged down, for example, that if they're up here in the 40s and they're trying to get to 30, or if they're in the 30s, they need to get to 25 because it's some cutoff point. But if you look at the risk, particularly of cardiovascular disease, look at the big reduction you get from 40 to about 35. I mean, that's an unbelievable reduction in risk. It's you know more than half, my math's not that good. But about three to about, I don't know, 1.8, 1.7, 1.5, whatever the number is, Whereas if you go from here to here, you're not getting as much action. So it's another way of saying the higher you are on this scale, BMI scale, small changes in, within that high range make a very potent difference in your risk. Blood pressure, very nice changes, about a 10 pound weight loss, this is across uh, a lot of different studies get your blood pressure down by about six points. Even over 16 years, small changes in weight make a big difference. Compared to those who lost a little over five pounds, or equal to or, five, great, equal to or greater than five pounds, or those who gained, you can see a reduction in overall cardiovascular risk reduction. This is a study that many of you have heard about, probably a diabetes prevention program. It took people who were just on the cusp of getting type 2 diabetes. So they have pre-diabetes, and the, da the data are that about 10% of people with pre-diabetes get diabetes each year. So you'd expect about four years later, 40% of those people in that high-risk group would get diabetes. So this is a study that looked at three things, a placebo pill, no active ingredient, metformin, a drug used to treat diabetes, and a lifestyle modification. The lifestyle modification got about a 6% weight loss 
regained to about a 4% four years later. And the question this 26 center team was interested in is what did those two things, the drug or the lifestyle intervention, do in relation to preventing people from having diabetes? And you can see, sure enough, 10% of people per year in the placebo group, almost 40% four years later, actually got diabetes. That risk was lowered by about 30% in the metformin group and reduced by nearly 60% in the lifestyle group. The reason I point this out is that is, a tr to most people's way of thinking, that's a trivial amount of weight loss, right? It's 4% over four years. That's laughable, 4%, four years? It actually prevented diabetes or reduced the risk of getting diabetes. Another study, this is at the other end of the uh, continuum, if you will, people already have diabetes. Uh, <clears throat> this is called the Look Ahead Study. So I can't see the number very well there. The slide's not populating so well, maybe. It's too fancy a slide for me. Um, what you can see is a control group lost a little bit of weight. The group that got a very intensive intervention, behavioral intervention, used meal replacements, lost about almost 9% of body weight and had regained not quite half, but maybe a third or so. Despite that, there were improvements in blood sugar, blood pressure, blood fats, cholesterol. The last study I want to show you uh, is a study of ours that we've done looking at the effects of weight loss on sleep apnea. And what you can see is on the left-hand side, this is four years. This is a subset of people who had diabetes and sleep apnea. The control group didn't lose much weight. The intervention group lost a lot of weight. That was about an 11% weight loss, but regained almost half of their weight over a four-year period. AHI is a, is a metric for how bad your sleep apnea is. And what you can see is that the control group actually went up a little bit and stayed flat over four years. Their weight was the same. But interestingly, and I think this is really good news, and it, and it, it feeds this idea of perfection as necessary, even when people lost weight and regained some, that the improvements in their sleep apnea were maintained. So this doesn't say, oh, who cares, you know, my sleep apnea will be fine, I can regain lots of weight, I don't have to care about it. It's not the point. The point is that if you get to some goal with a lot of effort and a lot of oomph and life gets in the way and you start to regain weight, clearly take that seriously and act on it aggressively. But even in that state where you have some weight regain, maybe from your lowest point ever, don't think that that confers no benefits. It clearly does. Quality of life, again, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. You all have lived this. Here are a bunch of nerdy scientists who go out and measure this stuff, like myself. But it really shows that quality of life improves significantly, even with small weight losses. This is 12 pounds over six months. So to the crux of the matter, how much is enough? How do you decide when you've lost 10, 20, 50, 100 pounds when it's enough? Well, I think there's a couple ways to go about this. One is to think about, if you think about the word motivation, a lot of people have said to me over the course of my career, look, I'm just not motivated anymore. You know, I've been at this for six months, or I've been at this for six years, or I've been at this for two years. Just not motivated. I think one way to think about motivation is not some sort of thing that's up in the air or something that can be infused. But to me, it's a very, um, uh, what's the word, calculated metric. And it really, to me, is the ratio, and this isn't my idea, the ratio of the cost of doing something versus the benefits, right? So if, you, if something costs a lot, it's really hard to do. Costs are high, and you don't get much from it, right? So you have to uh, monitor every morsel that you eat. You have to be at the gym two hours a day. And in return for that, you don't get much. Why would you be motivated to do that? Right? And this isn't just about weight, it's about anything in life. 
You're going to work really hard at some task at the office and you don't get acknowledged for it. You don't get paid more for it. Why would you be, quote, motivated? On the other hand, if something has moderate cost or relatively reasonable cost but has a lot of benefit, that is the benefits are greater than the cost, you're going to be very motivated. So one of the ways to think about this from my point of view is to look at the cost and benefits of losing more weight. And I think one of the, the mistakes that people can make in this process is they think about the overall cost of getting to their weight goal. And what I encourage you to think about is, let's say that you, um, you're saying to yourself, I need to lose another 10, wherever you came from, but I need to lose another 10. I would encourage you to sit down and map out very precisely what are you going to get for that extra 10? Well, yeah, it'll say 210 instead of 220. Or that's really not the idea, right? The idea is what will be different? I'll feel better. How will you feel better? And what's the evidence that you'll feel better after an extra 10 pounds? So this is the benefits, right? What are the other benefits of being 10 pounds lighter? Uh, the benefit may be that well, I'll be able to fit in some different clothes. Okay, what will that do for you? Are you unhappy in the clothes that you fit in now? Especially relative to where you came from? Maybe yes, maybe no. There's no right answer to this, but the idea is to go through very specifically what's the incremental, what's the additional benefit of going from where you are now to where you say you want to be. The other part, which is a little more difficult, and I encourage you to do that very specifically. Here's some examples. You know, I'll be healthier. A more specific one is my blood pressure will decrease. And this is where a healthcare professional can be very helpful to you. Because if you're expecting that, quote, I can get off medication if I lose another 10 pounds, that's something you probably want to check with your doc about, who knows your family history knows the meds you're on, knows what has happened with your previous weight loss, how sensitive your blood pressure is to weight loss. You don't want to be chasing this elusive dream for some elusive benefit that's not going to be realized. That doesn't mean it won't, it's just I'm suggesting that you get an accurate read on it. Um, I'll feel better. I wouldn't know what that means, really, if I was going to tell somebody, I'm going to feel better. Specifically, my knees will stop hurting, and again, Will your knees hurt less 10 pounds later from now? I don't really know. That's something that you would know maybe from your own history. Your doc would know, whoever's taking care of managing your knee pain. The other part that's sort of uh, tougher is what are the costs of going there? So a, a, I think a reasonable way to operationalize this is to take a 1 to 10 scale and to think how hard... Am I working right now? Hard's a little bit of a judgmental word. What's the intensity of the work I'm doing right now to manage my eating and my activity? And I think folks have a pretty good sense of this, right? You could say pretty easily, yeah, I'm working about a five, or I'm working about a nine, or I'm working about an 11 plus on a scale of one to 10. And if that's the case, that is, that you're working at a very high intensity, I'm not sure what else you could do, right? Because one of the untold stories in weight loss is the less you weigh, the less you have to eat, and the more you have to move. It's not fair, by the way. It's not an encouraging story that I'm going to leave you with. But the point is, I think that folks can get into this cycle of chasing this last 10 without thinking. It's easy to think about the benefits. I'm encouraging you to think about those specifically, not generically. But it's incredibly important to think about what it's going to take to get there, especially given where you are now. Again, if you're at a 5, maybe you've got some wiggle room. You can take that 5 to a 7 and get some weight off. But if you're a 9 or a 10, what does that mean? That means, okay, I'm at a 9 or a 10. I'm going to have to rev it up to a 10 or a 10 plus. And when I lose weight, that 10 or 10 plus won't be sufficient to keep off the weight. Because I'm going to have to work harder 10 pounds from now because I weigh less. And my body needs less energy when I weigh less by sheer 
it's not any bad thing that's happened through weight loss, it's just a fact, right? It takes less energy to support a 200 pound body than it does a 210 pound body. So again, I'm not trying to discourage you or beat you over the head with this, but it seems to me it's one of the things that professionals don't talk about that much. And that folks who struggle with this don't think about so much, partly because it's not as encouraging. Where it, what is encouraging is that it gives you some freedom to make some choices. Yeah, I could do this if I wanted to work an 11 plus, and then when I lost another 10 or 15 or 20, whatever your goal is, I wanted to do that chronically. But maybe, frankly, working a nine is just plenty for me. And maybe I can hang out here. Another way you can think about this is to do sort of a, not to sound too much like a nerdy scientist again, but to do a little bit of a test, a little bit of an experiment. And to give yourself some psychic relief from chasing that last 10. And say, look, I'm not making any life commitments here. I'm not saying I won't change my mind. But for the next three months, or if you can't fathom that, or you don't want to entertain that, for the next three weeks, I'm just going to try to maintain. And I'm going to be sort of like a little mini nerdy scientist of how hard that is for me. I'm actually going to pay attention to how difficult this is. And if I, at the end of that time, think, boy, this was a full-time job, or at least a part-time job, to maintain, then maybe that should create some pause and whether I really want to pursue this last 10. So in short, what I'm suggesting is to look at both the benefits and the cost or the pros and cons of chasing this extra 10. To be clear, what I'm not saying is that it's a bad idea to chase the extra 10 or it's a good idea to chase the extra 10. That's really going to be up to you. What I'm more encouraging broadly but quite specifically is to look at what are the benefits of doing that for you, and very specifically, and the cons or the downsides or the cost of doing that for you, very specifically. And to importantly <clears throat> temper this idea with these aspirational benefits you think you may get, in fact you may, with this extra weight loss, with the reality that when you do weigh less, the game gets just a little bit harder, right? So if you think about this as a percentage game, if you, lose your, if you reduce your body weight by 10%, you need to eat 10% fewer calories and or increase to adjust for that reduction. Not for a day, a week, a month, or a year, but for a lifetime. If you do that another 5%, so you want to go down 15%, you've got to eat 15% fewer calories and or shift your energy expenditure through physical activity. Doesn't mean it's not doable, but I think the more informed you are about the process, the better. So I want to end with where we sort of began with this frustration, what can be done about it? Frustration with maybe not getting to the goal you want, maybe uh, getting inappropriately focused on some number on a scale without the broader assessment of benefits and cost. I think a couple things you can do both personally and as an advocate, is to get the word out that this is a lie. It's a sort of a nasty lie, too, because it, it, it hits on a lot of the stigma and discrimination that people of size suffer from, which is if you just worked hard enough, if you just reduced your eating, if you just increased your physical activity, it's a level playing field because anybody could do it. And everybody in this room could weigh the same exact weight, even if, let's say, the same height. It's, just, it's nonsensical from a scientific point of view. People who eat the same and exercise the same don't weigh the same. They never have, they never will. And to put you in a position where you think that's the barometer, right? Lose as much as weight as you want is a bad position. I would also encourage you, especially as members of OAC, to advocate this position and talk about it. It's amazing to me how ill-informed society is about basic things about weight control. So let's give up that illusion and educate others 
And all I can tell you is, is you have as much chance of losing as much weight as you want as you do of triumphing over menopause with chocolate. <laughs> My last slide and comment before questions is to say, um, this is an approach, and I'm not promoting an approach, it's more a slide to get me to, to think of a point. This is a book written by Carol Johnson that says self-esteem comes in all sizes. This doesn't say, by the way, I don't care what I weigh, I'm healthy. There are some advocates of that approach and happy to answer questions about that, but um, I don't think it's as relevant here. What this says is, what's your position point when you're trying to manage your weight? If your position point is that I can't like myself until I lose weight, that's a position of weakness, and it won't generate any strength or power for the very difficult process that's required. It basically says, I have no worth, right, unless I get to some number. If alternatively, you can take a different position point and say, because I have value, because I'm worth it, I take my health seriously, and therefore I take my weight seriously, Boy, that's a position of strength, right? And that generates some power and some momentum for the very difficult work of long-term weight control. And I think somehow, because of the things that uh, I'm sure Ted addressed yesterday about the stigma and discrimination and the moral connotation that's associated with obesity, that somehow folks have, have harbored this belief that weight loss is something uh, that should be suffered through, right? For past sins or transgressions or whatever your moral model is, that this really has to hurt to help. Sort of the old football coach mentality, right? And what I encourage you to think about is that weight management is a positive process, not a punitive one. It's something you do for yourself, not against yourself. And the more it feels punitive, the more it feels like you're fighting yourself on a daily basis. That doesn't mean it's easy, by the way, but the end point is you. It's not the weight itself. It's the other things that weight does for you. And again, I'll go back to my point. If you can start from a position of strength that your weight is not, your worth is not measured on the scale, that you have significant worth independent of the scale, then I think these decisions, to be behavioral about this now, about whether to lose more weight or not, get to be very practical, um, informed decisions rather than more emotionally based and potentially irrational decisions. Um, so thanks for your attention and happy to answer any questions if you have them. talked about the um, weight loss and how that can make an effect on your sleep apnea and improving that. Is that only in regards to obstructive sleep apnea or have you seen an improvement at all in central sleep apnea? To my knowledge, it hasn't been studied very much in central sleep apnea and there's actually only about three or four studies now in obstructive. Mm -hmm. um, and in most of those studies, if people had central, predominantly central, they'd be dropped out. So my own take of the literature is that um, we don't know as much about central apnea in terms of its effect on uh, the effect of weight loss on it. So every, the, the data I showed you there was for obstructive. And there's three or four other studies, um, but mainly obstructive. Bob, do you know of any data on central? Yep, sorry. Hi, my name is Dana Osborne, and I'm from here in Phoenix. Um, first of all, thank you very, very much for this message. Um, a lot of meaningful stuff for me. I'm a VSG patient, I'm an, and um, I think I was in a unique position, position for some folks in the fact that my surgeon didn't give me a target weight as such, even though he probably has a secret one wit written on the chart somewhere. <laughs> Um, and, and I actually, um, like many folks, though, kind of started out with, you know, well, a BMI of normal is not probably realistic and find myself actually um, here on the brink with I'm about to hit that in a really weird position. And I don't know what my goal weight should be. So um, I think some of the stuff that you shared with me is uh, today is, will help me. But I actually think that 
I have many friends who have that magic number that was unrealistic. And, um, you know, I think we as peers try to encourage them about, you know, maybe that's not an unrealistic number, but the, the medical community still holds that number. So while I know that there's some kind of personal responsibility in how we can advocate for ourselves, I'm interested in what the medical community is doing to try to educate um, physicians and other treating providers that, you know, that BMI is not the right thing. Every weight loss place I go to, they say the BMI is not the right thing. They are the only measure, but I don't really see it changed in the medical community at large. Yeah, I think it's a very good point, and certainly Bob Kushner has led efforts uh, across the country to, to educate docs and to get a, a, a obesity a special a specialization, a board certification actually um, in obesity, um, so that really gets specialist physicians who, who get all of these issues. That's probably going to take some while, uh, take a while to do that. Uh, in the interim, I think there are you know, certainly educational things that happen, but, but I hear you. I think most, most docs don't get the message. Um, I think the rub for me becomes, if you look at BMI as a metric of risk in those graphs I showed you or any other graph, diabetes, high blood pressure, it actually does predict pretty well. So on a line, but you know what lines are, right? They're representation of averages or a lot of tens of thousands of points that are smoothed out to this line. So there will always be people who hit that BMI who aren't at risk, right? It's like people maybe who smoke who don't get cancer, or people who have a high genetic predisposition to a heart attack and don't get it. On average, I think BMI is a relative indicator of risk. So I don't want to give you the idea, but not for everybody. On the other hand, to say that you would then take those data and say that's what your weight goal should be seems misguided. So I know it's easier for me to say than than for folks to do, but I'm not sure I'd pay a lot of attention to anybody who gives you a weight loss goal, including yourself, right? It's got to be informed about the context, about what, what's the level of effort, what's the level of oomph it's going to take to do that, and again, what's the outcome. For some people, they're willing to put in an 11 plus every day. Other people say, you know, seven, eight, nine's plenty for me. So I, I would just try to, to feel supported in the fact that you're going to know this better than others, and, um, and to be comfortable with that. You know, you might have somebody, I'm trying to think of another analogy in a medical condition. Let's say somebody had diabetes and um, every good piece of data says that it's better if your A1C, which is a measure of 90 day blood sugar, should be below a seven. But for five years, your A1C was 11 and now it's 7.5 or eight. Would you feel like you failed because you're not below seven? Maybe this is the best you can do, the best between the behavior you're doing and the biology you're given. So it's a long-winded answer to say, I get it. Um, I would try to make that a very personal decision and try not to have your friends, colleagues, or you be as affected by what somebody sort of, maybe with good data or good intent told you, but I just don't think it's very practical. I'm Evelyn Glass from Dallas, Texas. You actually are meddling with me because I have 10 pounds to lose to be normal, okay? And that's my own personal goal. It was not part of the surgeon. But you see, I've lost 100 pounds three times in my life where I go down and I'm immediately back up. So at this age where I am now, I'm determined, since I don't have like 60 more years to live, that I'm going to do that again. But what the saving grace for your presentation for me was on experiment. Um, whether it's eating or exercising, I'm doing something very different than what I've done before. And I know I can still tweak what I eat. And certainly the moves that I make or ways of moving, I'm still experimenting with. So I have no intentions of going back up the way I have before. But it's also because I'm willing to experiment. So I appreciate, even though you're meddling with my 10 pounds, <laughs> uh, that word saved your presentation for me. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Con congrats on your success. And it, they're, they're your 10 pounds, right? So you can, you can go chase them or not chase them. It, it's really a personal decision. 
Hi, I'm Pandora Williams from Portland, Oregon. Um, I just want to say, first of all, thank you, because the message that you gave to everyone here this year is a message that Dr. Kushner gave to me at the lunch with the experts yes, uh, last year that actually changed my life. Like, that was the wow moment for me in this convention last year. Um, I've lost 96.2% of my body weight. I went from 420 pounds to 160, and that last 10 pounds trying to reach a normal BMI was, like, haunting me. Um, when Dr. Kushner helped me with that, I went forward this year to start studying to become a personal trainer. And one of the things that I have found so frustrating is that when they teach us baseline body composition in personal training, we are taught skin fold testing, we are taught BMI, we are taught waist measurements, and none of these things fit a bariatric population. So I'm very curious to know if you, what you suggest as a baseline measurement in a bariatric population, and if you see in the future maybe a different standard for a bariatric population as far as baseline body composition. Yeah, frankly, I'm not a body composition expert, so, um, but this is my take on it. If, if we came up, quote, with a better measure, people would still be sucked into following that measure and not paying attention to the context of their lives and what are those benefits and costs. So if we found something that could more accurately assess risk or the type of fat or the metabolic activity of fat, and there's lots of works going on in that area, again, I think it could be a little bit of a red herring. I take your point about a lot of the measures we have are imperfect, which to me would be sort of giving folks liberty to think about their own experience rather than what some chart said. Thank you. Sure. We're done. I'm sure we can take those last few questions up at the front. Apologize to cut that off. It is time for lunch with the experts. If you are going to lunch with the experts, please make your way back upstairs um, where we had our lunch yesterday and our dinner last night. There's plenty of folks to help direct you. And uh, we'll see you back down after lunch. Thank you. <laughs>